Hello. So concave and convex, words used to describe how a graph actually curves. You will have already learnt about increasing and decreasing for functions. So that's when a curve is going down or a curve is going up. And that is all dependent on the gradient function, which is what you get when you work out the first derivative. But we can go a bit deeper than that and work out how a curve is going up or going down. So if we have a look at these examples that I've got on the screen, um, we've got concave is your going over type of graph and your convex is going under. Now you see I've got two examples for each one. And if you've read around in this subject at all, you may have noticed that people talk about concave up, concave down, convex up, convex down. So that's why I've given uh, two versions of each one. They are So in concave, these two graphs, they are both still concave, but you've got on the left, you've got a decreasing curve that is concave. So that would be concave down. And then you've got an increasing curve that is concave. And I've got the same for convex, except I've done the increasing one first and the decreasing one second. So you know that you can work out your first derivative. You know that if that is positive, the curve is increasing. And if it's negative, the curve is decreasing. But how do we go and work out that extra information about how the curve is actually changing itself? Well, we need to look at how the gradient is then changing. Okay, so you'll see that I've drawn some lines on these curves. So these are tangents and they represent the gradient at the uh, particular point on the curve where they touch. Um, we're just looking at how the gradient changes as you move along a curve that is, for example, concave. So here we can see we've got a negative gradient that then gets steeper. And a negative gradient getting steeper actually means that the gradient is decreasing. It's moving to the left on the number line. It's getting more negative. And if we have a look at the concave curve that's going up, we've got a steep positive gradient that then becomes less steep as you move along the curve. So again, we're still decreasing in the value of the gradient. So we'd expect then that convex would be the opposite. So let's check. We've got a positive gradient, and then as we move along the curve, it gets more steep. So again, increasing. And on the convex down graph, where we've got a decreasing function, we start quite steep negative. And then as we move along, we get less negative. So in both cases for convex, we have an increasing gradient. And in both cases for concave, we have a decreasing gradient. So it's how the gradient changes um, that we're going to use to decide which parts of a curve are concave or convex, or whether a, a curve is entirely concave and convex across all values. So let's get that written down. So we need to write this in a more mathsy way. At the moment we've just got, got words. So it's this rate of change. Okay, so we, when we say something is decreasing, we can say that the rate of change is negative. And then how do we represent the rate of change? Well, that's where differentiating comes in. Okay, so the normal first derivative, dy by dx, that is the rate of change of y, so rate of change of the function itself. And we want the rate of change of the gradient. So we're going to use differentiation again on our first derivative. And the way that we write that down using our um, mathematical notation is a d by dx. So this is work out the rate of change with respect to x of and then it's of something. So you, so you can put a function here. So we normally put y for the first derivative, but what we're actually doing here is we're applying this to um, the first derivative. So then we do dy by dx. So we are applying the d by dx function to dy by dx. And that's not normally written like that, but I wanted to explain why when we then write it in a more compact way, we put d squared y over dx squared and that's so you'll probably recognize that as a second derivative because you would have used it to do things like um, find the nature of your turning points but it does mean d by dx of d by dx of y so the y isn't actually part of this structure it's more that you differentiate on the y and that's why we square the d and not the y as well in the second derivative um, notation. Now we wanted to say this was negative so we're obviously going to put an inequality sign on that and put a zero so that's how we state something is negative but I will add that if we are just um, 
generally describing the condition for concavity, then we would actually put less than or equal to zero. So obviously that may, might make you think, well, there's going to be a clash though, because if we do the same for convex and that's greater than or equal to zero, then what about when they're zero? Is it concave? Is it convex? How are you supposed to know? But you've got two possibilities for when the second derivative actually equals zero. Either it is changing between concave and convex, which is a point of inflection, which we'll go through properly in a separate video, or it continues to be concave or convex. And a really good example of that would be something like a, um, a parabola. That's a very bad parabola, but you get the idea. So this has a constantly decreasing gradient when, and the whole curve is, is concave, but um, at, at the turning point, if it's um, something like x minus x to the four or something, you, you will still get zero for the second derivative. So it's not a change between concave and convex, so we can't say, oh, that's always a point of inflection. But we um, we do need to include zero in our general description. Now, if your curve is great, um, has your second derivative less than zero, like strictly less than zero everywhere, then you can say that it's strictly convex. I mean, strictly concave. Okay, so I'm just going to pop this down in function notation as well. So that's the each dash means uh, another go at the derivative. So second derivative would be f dash dash. Okay, so we've got our formally written down um, condition for being concave. Second derivative is less than or equal to zero. We're going to do the same thing over here now. So d by dx of dy by dx. So the rate of change of the gradient is greater than or equal to zero. Do the same thing again, but with the better notation. There we go. Greater than or equal to zero. And then we've got our function notation. So this is all you really need to know for determining where gra uh, graphs are concave and convex. Um, well, so we'll just do an example now so you can see it in action and get to do a bit of differentiation. So the example we're going to have a look at is y equals ln of x squared plus 1. And the question could be to work out where this graph is concave, work out where it's convex. But we're just going to investigate the curvature in general. So we're kind of answering both possible questions. Now, obviously, we're going to need to jump straight into differentiating because we know that the only way we're going to work out if a graph is concave or convex is to do the second derivative. So let's start with just the first derivative. So we're going to use chain rule here. So differentiating a ln gives us 1 over x squared plus 1. And then we multiply by the derivative of what's inside, which is 2x. And then I'm just going to write that as a single fraction. Nothing can be simplify so 2x over x squared plus 1 then we're going to have to differentiate again All right. now this time we're going to have to use the quotient rule so we've got u and v and the quotient rule goes v du minus u dv over v squared and it is in the formula book if you forget it so we're going to differentiate the top first and leave the bottom alone so that's going to be two lots of x squared plus 1 and then we'll take away leave the top alone and differentiate the bottom so that's 2x so 2x from leaving the top alone and 2x from differentiating x squared plus 1 and that's all over x squared plus 1 squared let's tidy up the numerator before we do anything with it so we're going to get 2x squared plus 2 minus 4x squared so that's going to give us a minus 2x squared so we'll write the 2 first 2 minus 2x squared over x squared plus 1 or squared there we go we've got our second derivative so now it's a case of working out where it's positive and negative now an easier thing to do rather than jumping into inequalities would be just to solve when it's equal to zero and even if you are only looking for when it's concave or convex in particular part of that process will be finding the critical points like the the solutions to the equation anyway so we can jump in and do that first now the denominator um, obviously when you're solving equal to zero you'd ignore the denominator anyway but even more when when considering 
a positive or negativeness of this. The denominator in this case is always positive, so it's not going to affect the sign of it. We're only interested in how the numerator behaves because our denominator is always positive, and that's because it's a square, by the way. That's how we know it's always positive. It's also going to be greater than zero, which is good because it has a square plus one. So back to the two minus two x squared. So let's solve that so we can find the solutions. Now we can we can either move stuff around or we could factorize. Factorizing looks like more fun, so we'll go for that. So two lots of one minus x squared. That is very nice because it is difference of two squares. So one plus x and one minus x giving us two solutions of negative one and one. Okay, so we've got the points at which it's zero, but we need to know where it's positive and negative. And we've got two options for this particular um, function. And um, we'll, for the first option we'll do is one that you can apply to any of them. Now, the reason I'm saying that only the first one you can apply to any of them is because the second one is gonna be to sketch two minus two x squared, much like we would do if we were solving an inequality, because it's just a quadratic, and look at where it's positive and negative. But if the function that you end up with after the differentiating twice isn't just a nice function you can sketch, then you're going to have to rely on this first method we're going to do, which is where you look um, either side of your solutions. So we are going to draw up a little table. So we're going to have minus one. We're going to go either side. So we may as well just go uh, minus two and we'll go zero. And then obviously we've got one and then two. So these are our x values and we're going to look at the sign of the second derivative. Now we know that it's zero here and zero here. But what about in between them, for example? So if we take zero as a value that's in between, then uh, if we plug zero into this, we don't care about the denominator because we know that that's coming out positive anyway. Um, put zero into this, we're gonna get just positive two. So I'm not, I'm not gonna make a note of the value. All I'm interested in is whether it's positive or negative. So it's definitely positive in there. And then here, minus two, if I put minus two in here, I'm gonna get um, four times two is eight. Two minus eight is definitely negative, so that's negative there. And then if I put positive two, I'm gonna get the same result as if I put negative two in because it's squaring it, so that's also negative there. So this was just a quick way to see what kind of sign my function has either side of the places where it equals zero. This actually also confirms um, that our minus one, and x equals minus one and one are points of inflection. And we'll, I'm going to talk about that in another video in more detail anyway. So uh, I'll quickly show you the other method um, that we could have done here, which is to take the graph y equals 2 minus 2x squared and just draw a little sketch. So we've got minus 1 and 1 root. It's an um, unhappy parabola. So we're going to go over like this. Ooh, a bit wonky there. Uh, minus one and one and um, now we can just look and say well if we're between minus one and one our graph has positive values so the second derivative has positive values and if we're below minus one or above one then our graph has negative values so that's kind of quicker if you're good at sketching it doesn't take you long to work out what the sketch should look like but again if your graph is if the function is not one that you can sketch then you can just go ahead and do this table so let's write down our conclusion then. So we are, let's do the positive one first. If we're positive, we're convex. So this graph is convex. Now, because we know when it equals zero, there are definitely points of inflection because we change from positive to negative values. Um, we don't have to include zero in our definition of where it is convex. And if we wanted to, we could actually put strictly convex. Um, but convex between, now let's write these answers in set notation because sometimes the question requires you to do that. So maybe it's a good habit to write your answers in that form. Anyway, this does require me drawing set brackets, which I'm not very good at, so apologies for that. So <laughs> that's a perfect example of a bad set bracket. Um, so we say x such that, now this is the one where we're in between minus one and one. So we do this, put the condition, and then we close our set bracket. Much better bracket there. And concave is going to be the rest of it. So this one we have to actually write as two sets because we've got First of all, when x is less than minus one, and that's its own set. And then we've got the set of values where x is greater than one. 
and then we have to write a union in between okay so that basically just says or so you can be in this set of values or you can be in this set of values and our little um dot dots that we're doing here these are just saying such that so x x values such that x is less than minus one will just contain all the numbers less than minus one okay so there's the conclusion on that question we've worked out where the graph is concave and convex let's have a look at the graph of this function so we can check uh, that we've well one that we've got it right and two that it makes sense with what we're actually seeing so here's ln of x squared plus one so we can see that so it's meant to be that all the while we're less than negative one we're concave so negative one is approximately here so we can see here with this is definitely an over type of curve if we drew some tangents along here they'd definitely be decreasing and on the other side it's about being above one so again this is an another concave curve it's going over so that makes sense for what we found and then we said that in the middle it would be convex so this is an undery type of graph perfect exactly what we expected and these things here they're actually quite hard to spot unless you worked out the values but this is where we go the exact moment we go from being concave to convex but like i have mentioned a couple of times already i will be doing a separate video just on these lovely points of inflection well i hope you found all of that helpful um, please leave a like and feel free to comment on the video if there's any different examples you want me to go through or any other topics that you want me to address and I will see you in the next one. Bye.